Okay, welcome to the third lecture in our virtualization course. So today we're going to talk about an advanced topic of emulation, which is called binary translation. So in the previous lecture, we've seen a basic approach to emulating a processor or CPU of a system. And that was a very simple approach. We started from the very beginning. So what we call the reset vector or the reset address. So the first address of the first instruction that a CPU executes after it's switched on or being reset. And then one instruction after the other, we fetch the next instruction from the current address of the program counter from memory, which can be seen in the first line of our while loop here. And then we had a big switch statement and switched according to what we call the opcode. So the part of an instruction which indicates which operation to perform. So here is an excerpt of an example for the 6502 processor that we've shown last time already. So on the 6502, we can get uh, yeah, a very simple approach going so an opcode is always a byte, so eight bits long. So we always fetch one single byte from memory. And then we can decide on the value of that byte what to do. And if we need additional values, like a two byte absolute address to load a value from into a register or an immediate value, we can fetch them from the bytes immediately following the program counter. Then we update the program counter and we go through the loop once again with our next instruction. And we figured out that this basic mode of emulation is pretty slow. So last time I asked you how many 6502 instructions were executed, you could count this, and how many instructions on the emulating machine, so on the host machine, that might be an x86 or an ARM process, for example, were executed. Now I already gave you some reasons why it is so slow. Each instruction, of the guest machine has to be read from memory first and has to be coded every time. And this also happens for every iteration of a loop where we actually did this work in the previous loop iteration. But since we don't keep any memory of this, we have to do it over again. Parameters of the instructions have to be fetched separately from memory, which takes some overhead. There is some overhead involved in executing the while loop itself and also the big switch statement. We have to keep track of the current PC. So an instruction on the 6502 may be one, two or three bytes long. So we have to update the PC accordingly. And of course, if we do a branch or jump instruction, so we change our control flow, we have to update this in addition. Finally, a CPU also generates what we call flags to indicate the results of arithmetic operations usually. So we have a zero flag, for example, that indicates that a result was zero, or we have a carry flag, which indicates that a result generated an arithmetic carry or an overflow flag, which indicates that the result does not fit into a register anymore. And these have to be updated with every arithmetic operation that generates these, though we don't really know in the general case, if this result is ever actually going to be used. If we take a look at our very small example program on the right hand side, we can actually count the number of 6502 guest instructions that are executed. So we have the two instructions at label start at the beginning the, in blue. So these are executed once because they're before the loop. So we have two instructions. Then we have our loop body starting at label loop. And this consists of the four instructions from STA to BCC. And since we print out the whole alphabet, uh, this loop is iterated 26 times. So we have 26 times four instructions here. And we have the final break instruction to terminate our program at the end, which results in a total of 107 instructions on a 6502. Now, if you start to measure this, uh, the simple emulator as it executes and emulates our program here, you find out that the execution of our emulator on the host system will use about 5,800 instructions on a 64-bit x86 system and is not that much different on ARM. So roughly on average, it takes about 50 host instructions to execute one single guest instruction. And as you can imagine, that's quite a lot. This 
is actually feasible to emulate the 6502 this way today because we have processes that are more than a thousand times faster than the 6502. So the 6502 originally ran at one megahertz and our current processes run at multiple gigahertz. So this is feasible, but nevertheless, it's a waste of compute time. It's a waste of resources. So can we do better without changing the hardware? So can we apply some optimizations to the interpreter? Can we maybe even statically translate our program to x86 code so we no longer have to interpret all the original instructions? Or can we do something in between, which we call dynamic or just a time computation? Let's see, how does it compare to the real world? Now, in the real world, we are also used to translating things. So very often we have to translate from one human language to the other, for example, from English to German. And that's, of course, a very common problem. That's thousands of years old. And in general, there are two ways to translate human languages. So first, if you want to do a live translation of somebody who's speaking, for example, as shown on the left-hand side of the picture in the European Parliament, uh, then, well, you have to do it online using a live translator or, of course, as we call them, interpreter. But of course, you know that you can also do offline translation, for example, of an article or a book, if it's not time critical. And then, of course, you always translate the whole thing at once before submitting it, for example, for print. And we can also do something similar for translating binary programs. So we did the interpretation so far, as shown on the left-hand side. Can we do something like our static translation on the right-hand side, or does uh, the fact that we're using a computer here instead of human language also allow us to explore some additional approaches which are somewhere in between a static and a dynamic translation. So the first thing is, can we do better with our current interpreter? So can we somehow optimize the deficiencies away? So this interpreter we've seen in the previous lecture is also called a decode and dispatch interpreter. So the decode is happening at the fetch of the instruction opcode from memory and then our switch statement which decodes the actual instruction and then dispatches to the actual code in the uh, uh, separate case statements that take care of emulating our instructions. And as you see on the right hand side, if uh, our compiler isn't particularly in uh, intelligent, it uses a rather large number of branch instructions on the host machine. So first it compares to the first opcode, if that doesn't match, it compares to the second one, if that doesn't match, it compares to the third one, and so on, until you're through with all the opcodes that you have to implement. These branch instructions, no matter if they're direct or indirect, uh, they tend to reduce the execution performance, particularly if they're difficult to predict. In this case, they are quite difficult to predict because the CPU doesn't know what the next instruction uh, of the guest machine to interpret actually is. Even though if we're running in a loop, that is too much for a current branch predictor in a modern CPU. So the first thing is, can we get rid of most of these branch instructions inside of our big case statement? So uh, one approach to do this is to use the method which we call thread interpretation. So if you look at our initial loop, we always have the same code at the beginning of the loop, so a memory fetch, and then this big switch uh, statement here. And the idea now is to actually append a portion of the dispatch code directly to the end of each of the case statements, which interpret, uh, which interpret or emulate a single instruction. That's like threading like pearls on a chain or something like this. So that's why we call it threaded interpretation. And this requires, of course, that we know where to jump next. So when we fetch an instruction, we now know, need to know which piece of code needs to be executed for, uh, after our current uh, instruction emulation. So this means we have to take the address of the dispatch code for each of our emulated instructions and store it somewhere in an array. And this array can then be indexed using the original opcode of the guest machine to indicate which part of code to execute next. 
So if you look at the picture on the lower hand uh, part of the slide here, on the left hand side, of course, you see native execution where you just execute the instructions of our guest machine, which we just call source code here, though, take care, this is not source code as in C source code. Of course, this is the binary object code of the source or guest machine. In the middle is our previous approach, our decode and dispatch interpreter. So we have this part in the middle continually running the dispatch loop. This dispatch loop uh, runs uh, indicated uh, by the solid arrows and fetches data from our original machine code program of the guest machine, which is indicated by the dotted arrows here. And then deciding on the actual value loaded from our guest machine instruction memory, it calls an interpreter routine in our case by just switching between different cases of our switch statement. Now, what we want to achieve with the threaded interpretation is shown on the right hand side. So we start off with the interpreter routine of the very first instruction. So we jump into it. And then at the end of the interpreter routine of the first instruction, we just fetch the next instruction from the guest instruction memory. And then don't go back into a central loop, but just use this directly to jump to another piece of code to the next interpreter routine for the next instruction and so on and so forth. So here we eliminate the overhead of the dispatch loop and part of the overhead of our big switch statement, which can already make quite a bit of a difference. So if we look at code to implement it, at the end of each of our case statements, which we already had, we can directly jump to the code emulating the following instruction. Hmm. Does this really work? Let's see. Uh, let's take the first case, OXAD. So we fetch the opcode again, and then we go to a dispatch function uh, that indicates where the code for the next opcode is. Well, the first thing you notice here, it uses go to. Of course, in your very first semester of computer science education, you probably were told go to is bad for you. So never use go to. It uh, helps. Uh, it, uh, it helps to make your code unstructured. It produces chaos uh, or what we call spaghetti code. And so avoid go to at any case. Now here, of course, we're talking about performance optimization, and a go to is just an implementation of a jump statement in assembler language. So essentially, we're emulating in some uh, way the behavior of the machine. But one problem remains. What is this target address of this dispatch array, uh, which we are uh, supposed to be delivered back from this dispatch array when we index it in opcode? So how can we actually go to some piece in code somewhere? The general problem here is how to obtain the address of an arbitrary instruction in C. So you might know already that you can do it for functions. And for functions, the name of a function also serves as what we call a function pointer. So essentially a pointer to the very first instruction of the code implementing the function. Now this function pointer syntax in C is a bit unusual, or some people say it's pretty ugly, so I have to look it up every time I use it. So the red line here gives you the data type for a function pointer. This function pointer is just a pointer variable, like a pointer to an integer or character variable. But here, of course, it points to code, not to data. But since code and data for the machine are impossible to distinguish, it doesn't matter much. So this red line tells our C compiler that we want to declare a function pointer. So this is what the middle asterisk func pointer here indicates. And this function pointer, like every function, needs to conform to a prototype. So this function returns an integer, so the int on the left-hand side. And it takes two parameters uh, in the brackets on the right-hand side, which are also integers. And we can use it as shown below in the code. So we have a function int add, which takes two parameters a and b, and surprisingly returns the sum of a and b. Now, of course, we can call add directly, but imagine you want to do a pocket calculator uh, emulator, 
And so you want to call add or subtract or multiply or divide depending on which key was actually pressed. You'd either use a switch statement or you could use a function pointer to each of these four repeats for addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. So here we just show one example of how to use it for add. So we've declared our function pointer variable on top in the red line. So we can now set the value of that function pointer to our function add. And this is simply done like shown in the first line in main. So function pointer equals add. So the name of a function doubles as the name of a pointer to the function in C. So what happens here is that our C compiler actually stores the address of the function add, so of the first instruction of that function, in our function pointer variable fun pointer. And then we can call it as shown in the next line. So we can just use a printf statement to print uh, an integer. And this calls a fun pointer. So we dereference the function pointer with two parameters 23 and 42. And the return value is then passed to our printf, which prints it. And here you can imagine if you set fun pointer to a different function like subtract or multiply, of course, it would use the appropriate function here. So the problem is we don't have functions. We have blocks of code in our switch statement. Now, obviously you could implement each of these cases of our switch statement as functions, but that would again imply a, quite a bit of overhead because then you'd have to call a function and this function needs to set parameters before it's executed, then it needs to restore parameters and has to jump back. So overall, there would be not a lot uh, of overhead to be saved, if at all. So the question is, can we actually jump somewhere inside of our code, so inside of a function, instead of to the beginning of a function? Or can we just get the address of a regular C instruction? And it turns out that no, you cannot. You cannot do this, at least in standard C. But luckily, there's an extension which is supported by GCC and also by the Clang C compiler, which is called the double end operator here. So what you can do here is uh, on the right hand side, you can write pieces of code. And these are essentially your former cases of your switch statement. And you have to prefix them with what we call a label. So labels in the code on the right hand side are LDA underline apps and ADSA underline M. So a label can be something which starts with a letter uh, and then has uh, letters, numbers, so digits, or an underscore, and it always terminates with a colon. So this indicates that this point in the code, so the instruction, the C instruction following the declaration of that label is given a name and this is called LDA apps or ADCM. And that also stands for the address of that instruction immediately following the label. So using the add and operator as shown on the left hand side, to initialize our dispatch array, we can simply take the address. So what we do now is we start on the right hand side, jump into the very first dispatch routine here. It jumps to the respective label in our code using this go to instruction. And then when it finished emulating the instruction, it fetches the next opcode from memory and then uses our go to again and then takes dispatch of opcode. So it indexes our dispatch array with the next opcode we just fetched from memory and jumps to there. So jumps to the next label. And in order to be able to do this, we have to initialize our dispatch array as shown on the left hand side. So our dispatch array has uh, 255, that should be 256 actually, uh, elements here. And it's also an array of function pointers. So it's an array of 256 function pointers uh, called dispatch. And this array is an array of function pointers for functions that don't take a parameter. So the void in brackets on the right hand side and don't return a parameter because we don't actually jump uh, into a function and expect return values, we just jump into that address. And we initialize this with something which also needs to be a label, which is undefined. So initially, all our 256 dispatch routines in our array are pointing to uh, an implementation of undefined, which should just probably print our message and terminate our emulation. And afterwards, we can now initialize 
the single elements of our dispatch array. And as we said, they're indexed by the opcode of the instruction. So in the uh, initial uh, version of your interpreter code, you had case statements and the case statements then checked for the opcode. And now you replace this by just writing the opcode uh, as the uh, index of your dispatch array and then assigning the address of the respective handling routine to that element. So whenever you dereference that array dispatch of OX69, then the address of your label ADC IMM is returned. And the same, of course, for AD and LDA absolute. And of course, you also have to fill in all the other ones. Now, this already is a bit more efficient, but there's still some overhead which is created by this central dispatch table. So first, of course, you need a dispatch table, which now has to contain a number of entries, so 256 entries, and depending on if you have a 32 or 64 bit host machine, this means it's a kilobyte or two kilobytes of entries. Well, that's not too much, right? But uh, the next question is like, we always have to do this table lookup. And uh, we were wondering like, do you really have to do it? Or could you just replace this table look at it once? So we're still assuming instructions in memory don't change during the execution of our program. So uh, the idea now is to actually not just write a dispatch table, but to somehow pre-process our existing guest program already, so our existing machine code, to directly indicate the address of the handling instruction. So in other words, we want to replace or rewrite the original guest instructions in memory by a pre-decoded format. And this pre-decoded format contains the dispatch address and uh, optional parameters for each instruction. So we do this uh, using the structure shown on the uh, top right hand side. So this structure contains two elements. It contains a function pointer to a single dispatch function as before. And it contains an optional 16-bit unsent integer. So you've seen the largest parameter can be two bytes or 16 bits. So this parameter can contain zero bytes. So we just don't use it. It contains one byte or it can contain two bytes of our parameters. And then we make an array of this. So for each possible location in memory where an instruction could reside, so any of the 65,536 instructions, we actually generate one of these struct entries. So we see we're replacing runtime overhead for decoding by memory overhead because now we store more data. And then we need something before the execution of our guest program, before the interpretation, that rewrites our guest program into a form that conforms to our new pre-decoded table on the right-hand side. So essentially, we want to translate the left-hand side 6502 machine code to this pre-decoded array on the right. So this means array index 0100 uh, contains the address of the CLC handling code in our uh, interpreter, and it doesn't have a parameter. So it's initialized to zero. Entry 101 contains, as you can see on the left-hand side, the address of the LDA immediate emulation code, and it has a parameter of OX41. Now, the next line is interesting. There's a line 102. So, of course, we could have an instruction at address 102, uh, but we don't because our LDA instruction takes a one byte parameter. So, it takes two bytes. So, the next instruction only starts at 103. So, if something accidentally would jump to 102, we would probably want to stop our program. So we just say, okay, this is unimplemented. This doesn't have a parameter and would stop our emulation. Then at 103, we have our pre-decoded form of the STA instruction. This has a two byte parameter, the address of OXC000. Uh, this is a three byte instruction. So we have two bytes of unimplemented following and so on. Now you might be wondering like, why can't I leave out all the unimplemented stuff because well, there will be a lot of unimplemented instructions. Now, the idea is, of course, to index this new pre-coded dispatch array with the current program counter. So 
In order to be able to do this, we also need to have an address, an entry for all the addresses which are not the beginning, because we need to have an entry for each byte of our memory. That's why it's 65,536 entries long. And for all the locations in memory which are not the start of a machine instruction in memory, we have to tell our interpreter that it jumped to a place where it shouldn't have jumped to. If we like an index address to the struct, so let's say source PC and then dispatch function pointer and then a parameter, then we'd have to search through this table again. And this takes much longer, so we'd add additional overhead, whereas here we can just do an array lookup with the uh, respective program counter now, and this just requires adding a, uh, the offset to a constant base address, which is much faster. So our emulation can be much simpler now. So of course we still have to implement the emulation of the respective instructions here. And uh, the thing is that the instruction at the end of each of our former case statements, so for our little pieces of code that handle each of the emulated instructions, now just changes into a go-to statement that dereferences our array on the left-hand side. So this now points to a structure. So this structure has two values and the first one is adder. So it takes the adder, the address value, which is the address of the next label for the next instruction. We index this with a program counter now, and then we just jump to that one. Again, a bit faster, we save another instruction here. So pre-decoding already helps us quite a bit. So if we do pre-decoding, uh, of course, the next question is, can we do even better than that? So now we already started reading the original program before we start to execute it and transform it to something which is an intermediate representation that helps us to speed up interpretation. So can we not just take the remaining code, which is the single cases for emulating each of the instructions of the target machine, uh, can we not just uh, use these and uh, also build a completely translated piece, like translating a book? So we translate it from front to the end and then just run the translated code. And this approach obviously exists. Uh, so what we did is already a simple form of what we call static recompilation. We currently have transformed it into this intermediate form. We just save the function pointer to the next instruction. Uh, but can we also translate the complete program now before executing it? So the idea is to obtain another bit of performance improvement by mapping each of the individual source binary instruction to exactly that piece of customized target code we have written for emulating that specific instruction. So uh, if you look at our figure on the bottom here, you see in our pre-code approach, we uh, actually translated our source code into this table. And this table of intermediate code still had an entry for each of the memory locations. And then our interpreter routine referenced the program counter in there to jump between the specific cases. Whereas on the right hand side, using our binary translator, we would just have, for example, an x86 or an ARM version of our original 6502 uh, code, like we have a translated version of whatever book you read instead of one in the original language. Now, how can we implement such a static code translation approach? When using pre-decoding, we still need interpreter routines. And in binary translation, the converted code is actually directly executed instead of the original instruction. So a static translation can go from binary to binary, which is what is done in commercial products, but of course, we don't want to generate x86 or ARM binary instructions. That's a bit tedious. So we try an approach that's a bit easier to read for us. And that's an approach that we call code synthesis. So the idea behind code synthesis is very simple. You essentially go through your uh, original guest machine code, machine uh, binary code, and then replace each of the instructions that you find address after address with exactly that piece of code that is used 
to emulate the instruction in your emulator. So you essentially copy them over. Now, how on earth do you copy instructions over? Because when you execute a program, your interpreter or your static compiler, you don't have access to your own source code. Now, it's a very simple approach. We just generate a new C program out of the original binary program of our guest machine. And we generate it just by printing one after the other, the instructions for that C program, and then finally outputting it. And then to obtain a binary program for our host platform, we just run it through our host platform C compiler. That's maybe pretty much unusual. You might've heard of uh, like an approach uh, that's called quines. So programs that reproduce themselves, that's a bit of a convoluted form uh, for a mental challenge. But this here is the basic idea. We really just generate C source code appropriate for each of the instructions. And then we let the C compiler of our system take care. So for example, if we had the two instructions on the right hand side, we had an LDA absolute of OXC three zeros, uh, we would copy the LDA code to the right hand uh, uh, to, to the right hand side, just using a printf statement here. And then uh, there's an ADC of OX42. Uh, so we copy the emulation code for ADC directly after that. Please note that there's a typo in the slides. So the first PC equals PC plus two on the right hand side needs to be three because uh, we have a three byte instruction here. Sorry for that. Right. So this sounds very simple. And in fact, it's not too difficult, but there are some pitfalls, obviously, that we need to take care of. But first, uh, well, it seems we can generate C code, which directly implements a C version of the executed instruction of our guest machine. So our static translator no longer does any interpretation and execution. Instead of interpreting, it just prints the code that would be used for interpreting this instruction. And then we can use our host system C compiler to make it a binary program. In addition, we can actually use the C compiler's optimization on our host machine to enable further optimizations we can't do on that level. Now, this works very well for a number of instructions which are linear, so just execute one after the other. But the problem is shown in red on the right hand side here. So if we just copied our emulation code over somehow, well, uh, we would still need to somehow branch inside of our code. So this BCC instruction at address OX108 uh, that's copied to the right would manipulate our program counter. Well, that's nice, but then it would still continue with the next instruction. So here we have a problem that we need to solve. So how can we handle, yeah, control flow changes, so jumps and branches in code correctly. And here's a, a neat trick. We use labels again. So the idea is for each of the generated lines of code, uh, so each of the lines or blocks of C code representing one of the uh, guest machine instructions, we prefix, prefix each of this with a label. So for example, we could use a label convention that calls all these labels uh, starting with a capital L and then just has the four digit hexadecimal representation of the original guest uh, machine address uh, after it. So our first instruction CLC, which just clears the carry flag, would translate into our label 0100 because CLC was originally at address 0100, and that would implement the uh, instruction to just complement the carry flag. The next one, LDA41, would just be translated into our label 101, which just directly assigns 41 to our register RA. And here you see something interesting. Of course, we don't have to fetch this OX41 at runtime anymore because it's a constant. So we can add static compile time. So before we execute anything, can fetch this parameter from memory and directly write it into the code on the right hand side. So this already saves quite a lot of overhead. And then we have the SDA instruction and so on. Now, if we have a jump now, we know where we are jumping to. So in our left hand side uh, code, we have this BCC loop. And you've seen in the last lecture that there is no text loop standing in our original object code, obviously. There's just an offset. 
So there's an off offset indicating it's a negative offset for going from address 108 back to address 103. And we've calculated this as an offset uh, of minus 9. And this offset now can be used. So we know if we emulate an instruction that is at address 108. And still we have to check at runtime. So when we execute the translated code, if this condition holds or not, because it stops being true at the end of the loop, and then we have to fall through. So uh, on the right-hand side for L101, uh, one, zero, one, <laughs> zero, eight, sorry, uh, we still check the value of the carry flag. And if the carry flag is set, then we go to the label which corresponds to the absolute address of the target address. So just to L0103 above, which is, of course, the instruction after our label loop on the left-hand side. Now, of course, uh, probably a quick reminder, of course, we still translate the binary opcodes, even though we show the mnemonics of the assembler representation here. Uh, we could actually also translate assembler source code that <coughs> would also be possible and more similar to a regular compiler. And there are some transition projects, for example, uh, by a company called Digital Equipment. They transitioned from their old VAX processes to Alpha. And their operating system was partially written in VAX assembler, which was incompatible with the Alpha assembler. So they actually used an assembly compiler and assumed that the assembly uh, of the VAX machine would be an input language to a compiler generating Alpha code. So that would also be possible. But of course, binary translation is more general because binary translation does not require the source code of the guest program, so of our 6502 code to be available, so we can just translate the binary. So the idea for handling branches is to declare labels for each of the blocks of code, uh, emulating one given instruction in your code. And then if you need a branch to somewhere, well, you just branch to that label and all is well. Not quite. There are some problems. Problems with static code translation. So you can jump to a fixed address. So if you have a jump to an address that you give or a branch with a constant offset, that's easy enough. So for absolute addresses that are constant, you just jump to the label that has the name L and then the four hex digits of this absolute address. For a relative jump, you just have to calculate the difference between the address of your current label, your currently executing label and the target label, and then jump to that new label and generate code because we're just printing this code again that was shown on the right hand side on the previous slide. Now, unfortunately, there are also ways to jump to a moving target. So, for example, you can jump to an address that's contained in memory. So a target address in memory. And of course, you cannot predict at compile time before you execute your program what the contents in memory are. In the worst case, they could be dependent on some user input, which of course you cannot predict at compile time. And there's also a return instruction. So if you call a subroutine, uh, so function, then when you return from that function, the return value is actually on the stack. So it's also in memory. It's fetched from memory at runtime. And you cannot statically define it because you can call a function from several places in your original program. So of course, you'd need to correct uh, to jump back to return to the correct location where you came from. So how can we solve this? Now, the idea is again to do a bit of pre decoding. So, uh, you could build an array with addresses of labels for each PC value. So, just in case you have a branch or a jump or a return to an address which you cannot statically predetermine when you statically translate your program, you need to do a lookup. However, this gets a bit more complicated in case of real world code. This is not really a problem on modern code for RISC CPUs for something like that, but it's a problem on old CISC architectures like the 6502 or also x86, because on these machines, instructions can have varying lengths. So for the 6502, we see that instructions can be between one and three bytes in length. For the x86, it's even worse. An instruction can be between one and 70 bytes long. So the question is where on earth in memory does your instruction start? And people actually use 
the idea of that you can jump to any byte and that any data loaded from memory is just interpreted as an opcode and they used it for various things like optimization or confusing someone who wants to crack copy protection on the game and stuff like this. So there's real world code like shown on the bottom of the slide out there that actually does not jump to a nice and clean start of an instruction. But if you look at the branch instruction in line 108, this actually jumps to address 104. Now, if you look on the left hand side, there is no instruction, at least none that we intended to start at address 104. 104 is uh, the address containing the byte A9. So the first byte in little endian order of our target address for our STA, our store instruction. So what does the CPU do when it encounters this instruction? Well, the CPU has no clue about that. This is actually not intended to be the start of an instruction. So it reads that byte A9, puts it into its own internal decoder for the opcodes and says, oh, why A9 is an early A immediate instruction. So there needs to be another byte following, which is 40 here. So that's a byte in 105. So it performs an instruction to load the accumulator with the uh, immediate value hexadecimal 40. And then it just continues as 106 as if nothing has happened. Oh my. Of course, we never generated any code for emulating an A9, an LEA immediate instruction, starting at 104. We have no L0104 in our statically translated code. So uh, if stuff like that happens, then you're in trouble. So uh, this is especially important if you want to emulate video games, for example, but also uh, just the basic interpreter of the Commodore 64, which has a 6502 CPU, which uh, also uses these tricks to save a byte here and there. Now, why on earth do you want to save a single byte or two? Back then you were constrained because this code was not loaded from disk at start time, but it was burned into a read-only memory we call a ROM. So that's a ROM just short for read-only memory. And this read-only memory came in specific sizes. And of course, the larger the chip, well, the more expensive the chip was. So these sizes were powers of two. For example, you could get four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, or 16 kilobytes. And the idea was if you used a bit more than eight kilobytes, which is what uh, what the original Commodore 64 basic interpreter used, then you'd need to buy an expensive 16 kilobyte ROMs, which was maybe twice as expensive, just to store like 100 additional bytes. So if you could use these tricks and similar tricks to save these 100 bytes, then you could save a lot of money. Well, not considering that one machine, which would be maybe a dollar of difference back then, but consider the Commodore 64 was built 10 million times. So essentially, 10 million times, uh, $1 is quite a lot of money, obviously. So all these sorts of tricks were used. And of course, not only for saving bytes, but also, as I mentioned, for confusing people who used a simple, what we call disassembler, so a tool that just transfers the opcodes, the hex codes back to human readable form. And of course, your disassembler also would just go from start to finish through your instruction and not really figure out what's going on in the middle. So that would be an attempt to confuse reverse engineers, how we call them today, or hackers, as we used to call them back then. Uh, but of course, uh, well, uh, that was a well-known trick, so it didn't really help a lot. So in many situations, static translation is difficult or maybe even impossible to do. So we've seen our static translator was not aware that you could actually jump to 104. So it did not generate a translation for an instruction at that address. Since the linear scan we did from start to finish assumed that there would be a three byte instruction STA starting at 103. So it did not look at 104 as a possible start of an instruction. It is also possible to mix code and data. So uh, especially for these old 8-bit machines, it was very common to store data bytes in the middle of your code because the offsets that you could use to address them somehow, uh, uh, if you manage to use just 8-bit offsets instead of 16-bit offsets, you could again save a little bit of uh, memory and maybe execution speed. Uh, but of course, then your data object that you want to load would just be like 
a maximum of plus or minus 127 or minus 128 bytes away. So you'd have to mix code and data and stuff like that also happens if you look at 8-bit codes. So our translator can actually not decide for our code on the bottom here if the byte AA at address 109 is this actually a data byte. We could maybe assume it is one because we load it at address 103 above, but well, the static compiler doesn't know. So, uh, or if you would try to execute it, it would be a TSX transfer stack pointer to X register instruction. But of course, the static translator does not know. So this is called a code discovery problem. And we've given a lot of references, uh, which you can find at the back of the slide set, if you want to dig a bit deeper into this and how this can be solved. The final problem with static code translation is also a problem that's very common with old software that uses copy protection, for example, and this is self-modifying code. Uh, so a program can actually modify its own code in RAM. Of course, not in ROM because you cannot overwrite ROM, but if you have programs running in RAM, no, uh, there's nothing that hinders a program from just overwriting opcodes or data bytes of instructions of its own code and then executing that stuff again. So uh, this is very often used for obfuscation, malware, copy protection, stuff like that. And uh, well, it's hard to write and it's even more hard to uh, reverse engineer. And it's uh, even much more harder <laughs> to actually uh, translate this statically because you have no idea uh, what this instruction and at which point in time uh, these instructions are being rewritten to. So our translation was never able to create equivalent code for the modifications to the opcodes that happens. So one example for 6502 is uh, shown on the bottom of the slide here. So this is a very uh, well elaborate way to add the value of the X register to A by first storing the value of the X register with the STX instruction at label plus one. So that is the address of the zero immediate operand for our ADC instruction and then executing the ADC. And of course, after you use the store, then ADC actually has this new parameter uh, which we just stored, which was the previous value of the X register. And if you just statically translated zero there, well, then of course you would add the correct value. So there are ways to get around this. Uh, these uh, involve, for example, still uh, providing an interpreter for your code and providing the original machine code, just in case stuff like this happens. Uh, but there's maybe also another way to help with a number of these problems, especially the code location problem, and in some respect, also self-modifying code. And this approach is what we call dynamic binary, bi sorry, dynamic binary translation. So how can we solve code location and discovery problems and also try to handle self-modifying code? Now, the idea again is to actually do something at runtime of the program. So we translate the binary not before we start the program, but we translate it alongside of executing our emulated program. So we translate the binary while the program is operating on actual input data. So this means we no longer take the whole program and try to pre-decode or translate it, but we do it incrementally in blocks as the program reaches them. This also means we don't create overhead for any code that we never execute. So for example, imagine you're writing a letter in a word processor, but you never print it. You just write it and save it. And maybe the mail it out later with a separate program, but you never print it. So the whole set of print routines contained in your word processor that format your text to fit on the paper and send to the printer and stuff like that, this would be completely unused. And if it's never executed, would, would during your use of the program, well, then there's no need to translate it, right? So uh, the problem is at runtime, we cannot assume that we have a compiler available on the target machine that would also be just too slow. So here for our dynamic translation or what we call just in time or JIT translation, the translator actually has to generate binary machine instructions for the target immediately. So uh, this in turn means that we have to now uh, handle translations for smaller portions of our code. So for sections of our code, keep them in memory and maybe also 
uh, consider them as just being a cache of a translation of the original code. So when, for example, we would run out of memory, we could just throw these pieces of code away and then retranslate them on demand. So what we need for this is an emulation manager and the emulation manager is very similar to our original loop just going through the instructions but now it does not interpret the instructions using a big switch statement but it calls this a dynamic translator to translate a piece of code now the problem translation is expensive so we don't do it right away so the first thing we do is actually we start interpreting again and only when we figure out using some heuristics that it makes sense to translate a piece of code because we're executing it in a loop and this loop has a thousand iterations and we already ran through it three times. Then we can start doing a translation of that piece of code, like our loop body, and then replace the calling of the interpreter by calling of that cached piece of translated code for that specific code piece we were just investigating, like the body of a loop we're uh, using. And for this, again, we need something like our pre-coded stuff. So mapping of source to target, so of guest to a host machine, program counters, which is also shown in the diagram on the right-hand side. Again, dotted lines indicate data accesses. So the execution takes place between the emulator and the interpreter, or if the interpreter figures out, oh, this is already uh, somewhere executed a number of times, then it switches over to the translator. The translator generates pieces of code, which are then, if the emulation manager finds them the next time through the loop, then called, so jump to and jump back, instead of calling the interpreter for this piece of code. So essentially you have an identification of which pieces of code uh, for which addresses already you have a translation. If this translation is present, you call it. If not, you call the interpreter. And this interpreter that can then decide if it makes sense to translate a piece of code. So the components of such a dynamic binary translation system consist of this emulation manager, which is the high level control of the interpreter, which always starts executing unknown or uh, untranslated instructions, does some profiling, and this obviously operates on the original guest binary code. So for a JIT compiler or dynamic binary translation, you need the original binary code to be present. Then you have a static binary translator, which just translates blocks of code and not the whole code. And it, compared to our example before, it translates them directly to target machine code. This translation is relatively expensive, so it only makes sense if you can reuse that translated code because it's a frequently used function or it's a loop body or something like this, and your guest machine code is now translated in certain parts, which we call blocks, and the translated code for a certain guest machine code block is stored in a translation cache, and that, as every cache, holds recently used entries, so recently used blocks of translated code, and you can kick them out if you figure out like you're no longer using them. And then you need a mapping table to associate a source or guest program counter for a block of uh, source machine code with the host PC, the target PC of the cache entry for your corresponding block of translated code. So this is your way to index into this code cache, which is usually a hash table to make it faster, and an entry in the map table if it's available, then it's a translation cache hit, and if it's not available, then you have to interpret it, and eventually the interpreter will probably generate a translated piece of code in your cache for it and add an entry to your hash table. So the question is, what are these blocks that we are actually translating? For this, let's first define what a static basic block is. So this is a concept from compiler technology. So a static basic block of instructions contains a sequence of instructions which has a single entry point. So you always start a block of instructions at the first instruction and it has a single exit point so an exit point is a point where you are no longer guaranteed to execute a linear sequence of instructions or in other terms it's a branch or a jump or a return instruction something like this which can change your control flow so a static basic block begins and ends at all branch and jump instructions and all branch and jump targets so every branch or jump target in your code is the beginning 
of a basic block and this basic block can have some linear instructions like add and subtract and uh, clear carry and stuff like that which do not change control flow and as soon as you encounter a branch or a call or a jump or a return instruction then your basic block ends because this will uh, change your control flow. Now there might be some situations like shown on the right hand side here where uh, these static basic blocks uh, are actually a bit too constraining because in some situations of translations you might encounter some code coming from the top uh, as shown on the right hand side and then just going through your label loop until the next uh, branch conditional instruction here at the end of what we call block one on the right hand side so even though loop is the target of a branch instruction at the end of block two on the right hand side in this current execution because we do it dynamically we don't care about the start of this because for us this is still a linear sequence of instructions so a dynamic basic block actually considers the actual flow of instructions through the code and only stops as with static uh, basic blocks at the first branch instruction it encounters because with a branch it could either just uh, not branch and go to the load instruction at the bottom of the block one on the right hand side or it could decide on the condition to jump over and to the instruction after the skip statement in the yeah so uh so on the left hand side in part a you have the static basic blocks defined where there is a basic block starting before label loop because there's a label, label loop is a jump target as you see below there's another basic block at skip uh, starting at skip because you can jump to skip and with this dynamic tracing well what you actually do is you just follow the flow of control until you hit such a control flow changing instruction that makes it easier it might result in you having copies of code because what happens if you then somehow jump to loop well then you get another basic block but that just means you have a redundant translation of a part of your dynamic basic block so you have it twice but you have the same translation in there for this part so it doesn't really matter the overhead is actually pretty negligible here so the whole way of implementing dynamic uh, binary, binary translations, of course, first you load your source binary into memory as before with your uh, interpreting emulator. Then your emulation manager just starts interpreting the binary at the first instruction as we did before using a decode and dispatch or a thread method uh, like we've seen. And then uh, when it makes sense, the interpreter dynamically generates the translated target binary in parts, which represent the translation of our dynamic basic blocks here. This, these dynamic basic blocks and translations for these are placed in the code cache, the starting address of this dynamic location. So it's source to target PC mapping is placed into the map hash table. And whenever a branch or a jump encountered, uh, is encountered, then uh, well, we know we have completed the translation of the dynamic basic block, so uh, it's finished. And then whenever we encounter such an address as a target address, we can use the translated code. So the emulation manager then in step four follows the path of the guest machine, the source program's control flow using the mapping table. It checks if there's a hit. So if we already have a translation for that dynamic basic blocks, it just jumps to there. If not, we just call the interpreter for this piece of code so for the pc we're working on and incrementally more and more of the program is discovered and translated uh, eventually if your cal code cache is big enough and you never evict entries from your cache then uh, you would uh, actually execute only translated code in the end and there's interesting approaches like there's uh, for example a, a binary translator called fx32 by that company Digital Equipment I mentioned before, and that handled the problem of translating x86 Windows binaries to uh, Windows binaries running on their alpha processor. And that FX32 used a bit of a different approach, but very similar. So the first program run, it only ran the program interpreted and collected statistics. So of the frequency of execution of functions and loop bodies and so on. And then it saved this information along with the original program and when the next time the program was executed so the second time for example you started the intel version of microsoft word on your alpha machine then it started doing the dynamic translation based on the profiling obtained in the first step
So uh, this works very similar. There's uh, great papers on FX32 and the internals. If you're interested in that, let me know. So uh, one interesting thing is, of course, that if you happen to have a relatively new uh, MacBook or uh, Mac Mini or whatever, so one with the new M1 or M2 ARM processors, then uh, you actually use some of that maybe every day. So Apple has transitioned the Macintosh computers between different processor architectures a number of times since the introduction of the original Macintosh almost 40 years ago. So the original Macintosh used a processor of, a, of the Motorola 68K series. This was a CISC machine. And in a collaborative effort with IBM, they switched over Macintoshes to using uh, PowerPC, which is a RISC architecture, in 1996. So obviously, they needed to run the old programs on the new architecture, which was, which was not binary compatible. So they needed a sort of translator. Uh, amazingly, most of the operating system for the uh, original Motorola 68 KMX was written in assembler. So they not only translated the user mode programs, they also translated large parts of the operating system back then, which was not that efficient, to be honest. But it worked. Now, the next transi transition took place uh, almost exactly 10 years later, when power PCs were uh, still used in a number of applications like uh, high performance computing, but also games consoles. So if you use, uh, for example, an original Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3, these also have power PC processor cores. But unfortunately, power PCs were not really efficient on the desktop and especially on the mobile market. So there was no really fast power PC implementation available for building notebooks back then. And so Apple decided to switch processor architectures again. This time to Intel x86. First, they had one series of 32-bit implementations, and then they went to the then available 64-bit with the core two dual processors. And of course, same problem here. Now the operating system stayed the same, and they had to translate user applications from PowerPC to Intel x86. This time around, they actually recompiled all the operating system code for the new architecture. And then, well, uh, two years ago, x86 ran out of steam and Intel got into, got into a lot of trouble because they couldn't build energy efficient fast processes anymore because they couldn't keep up with developments in semiconductor manufacturing. So Apple switched to their own in-house built architecture called the M architecture, which is derived from the iPhone processes, obviously. And this is based on the ARM architecture, which is again, a RISC architecture, 64-bit uh, one. Uh, and uh, again, they needed a translator. And to enable users to continue the old software they used for the last two transitions from PowerPC to Intel and from Intel to ARM, a uh, software which is based on a software called Quick Transit by a company called Transitive Technologies, which is by coincidence now owned by IBM. And uh, Apple called this translator Rosetta after the original Rosetta Stone, which was used to uh, translate uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs to whatever model language we're using today. So Rosetta is a sort of a binary translation and the current system in use is the second iteration, so Rosetta 2, which is able to translate 64-bit x86 to 64-bit ARM code. And this is actually a combination of a static and dynamic binary translator. So it translates as much of the original code statically as it can, and then uses a JIT translator and interpreter at runtime for cases like self-modifying code and uh, things, code referencing data bytes in instruction memory, stuff like this. If you're interested in how this works, you can also experiment with stuff like this. Details and examples are available in a blog article, which we referenced here. So this is all about dynamic binary translation, static dynamic. I hope you find this a bit interesting. And the good thing is that, uh, all the, especially the Rosetta 2 software, on the ARM machines make it so seamless to translate software that you really have to check if you're not by accident running an x86 binary instead of the ARM binary you want to run. So here's a number of references. Again, we're of course working with the virtual machine book from Smith and Nair. So we're in chapter two. Uh, then, uh, there's a great article, which we also mentioned in the exercises by Graham Toll, which is an emulator writer's how-to for static binary translation. And this proposes the idea we presented for a static binary translator to just generate C code, for example, uh, that we can compile again 
Uh, so we can make use of uh, the compiler optimizations. There's a great uh, static 6502 and uh, static binary for setup uh, written by uh, Michael Steil, who uh, now lives in California. He was a student at, uh, of Kiel Munich. Uh, and this uh, translates 6502 into x86 machine code. Uh, he's in himself, he says, don't use that code, but it's still interesting to look at it. There's another article if you're interested in uh, yeah, game console emulation by Andrew Kelly about statically recompiling games for the NES. So again, 6502 code into native executables with the LL4M compiler toolchain and the Go programming language. Uh, there's a paper detailing the code discovery and code location problem by Horst Kuhl and Marovac. Um, then we have another paper describing a retargeted flow of static binary translation for ARM. Uh, an overview paper is number seven by Christina Sigüentes and uh, Vishma Hutra about uh, the different approaches to binary translation, static, dynamic, retargeted flow that means uh, able to handle another host platform than the one you're working with. Uh, if you're interested in the history of just in time, there's a great overview uh, by John Aycock in number eight. And finally, uh, if you're interested in how the Rosetta 2 system for Apple ARM Macs work, there's this blog article here. And there's also some code uh, on his GitHub repository. So that's all for today. Thanks for watching that video. And the next time, I hope we can have a lag lecture again. Thanks again. And until next time, bye.